Yeah. Yes. Very agree. Diana. Apart from the various meaning-based uh, explanations, have you seen or would you expect any changes that would just simply be formal? Like all things being equal, they a move towards a small, a shorter word, or away from a shorter word to a longer word. Have you looked at that at all? As far as formal, not necessarily. Um, I think I've read some studies on morphology that some of the roots might prefer the particular ending because that would end up being a shorter uh, word, uh, but that didn't necessarily seem to be uh, as much uh, evidence to support it. In this case, as far as form, I, I think it is, or at least examples that I have uh, and uh, studied and others that I have studied, they, the form doesn't necessarily except for whether it comes from more Latinate or not. Uh, then the Latinate tends to, to become, uh, to stay above. In those cases. Yes. Once the texts are in the printed form, over maybe, say, of course, of, uh, a century or so, are there changes in various editions that come out? Those yes. Are just kind of no, uh, it depends on the actual printing business. Uh, so when you, uh, the printing might have rights for, I don't know, maybe, let's say, 1,000 copies. And then after that, you have to renew that contract, so to speak, so it was the same uh, way. And then maybe you, maybe the new edition would introduce new changes. So in the case of, for instance, this one that I decided, it was faulty in many ways. Um, and in December, there was another edition. December of, 19, of 1481 that introduced uh, more changes. And in 1555, the most famous one, um, uh, but that of course I now escapes my mind, obviously. Um, but that one uh, that I remember, uh, that one was, uh, that's the, the most famous one because that's supposed to be the cleanest as far as mistakes were complete with glosses and all sorts of different things. So each edition, would bring another one. The Academy has another one in 1807. And that goes with different methodologies as far as bringing the text that it was original from back in the 13th century. So they had a whole bunch of manuscripts to work with. So they bring different, different changes each time. For me, it's interesting the incunables, which is the, the first printing, are the incunables. Those are very important because. That's the, that's the first version. And after that, the changes that happen, we don't know exactly how it happens, but the incunables are, are, are precious in that regard. So, so I, did, I wasn't here at the beginning, but you believe that those changes were kind of, were not irresponsible up to date. We're not? We're not irresponsible. You know, meaning uh, those were kind of, culture and modernizing the word, I don't know, but uh, compared to that standardization of today, how do you feel? They were, they were at, those changes were introduced consciously. Whether they knew or uh, what could happen with the text, then we don't know about that. And they, I don't think they knew about it. Uh, they were just putting their minds into a task that the Catholic monarchs had uh, requested, and they were putting their best effort to bring the best that they had in their minds as far as language. So in that attempt, they were manipulating consciously that text. <laughs> right? So imagine that someone is requesting the best document possible that you can write, and then you, you, you start manipulating that uh, to get the best possible text. And in doing that, what, what is showing to us is their actual mind as far as the linguistic mind of what is for them the preference. Mm -hmm. You had described the whole word Latinism just to in order to please or uh, you know to please the monarch. It could be the monarch, it could be the whole circle in which they were working with. because mm -hmm. uh, we cannot uh, you know personalize. Uh, they they had that task but they were moving around a circle that it was probably with the same state of mind as far as 
this is what we like, this is what we don't like, we prefer this, we prefer that. Nobody says this, everybody says that. Uh, so it's, it's the circle, the network. Yeah, there are others that I didn't include, for instance, the A personal. For instance, uh, back in uh, the end of the 15th century, early 16th century, the A personal was in variation when it was a, a plural uh, object, uh, when it was not necessarily obvious that you needed the A or not, because it wouldn't uh, make any, there wouldn't be any problem as far as understanding. So, yo doy uh, el caramelo a los amigos, in old Spanish, it would be, yo doy el caramelo a los amigos. And everybody would understand, and you don't need that a personal, because there's no need. But you see that variation in the 16th century, and you see in the printed version how they start adding the a, when it's a even when it's a plural option. So that's another case of syntax. The other case that is a little more problematic uh, has to do with um, Es difícil de hacer, es difícil hacer. So that the use of that preposition that is uh, in variation that appears as es difícil de hacer. And a few others are still working on that. I, I don't know if you consider that syntax or not, but in old Spanish, maybe old Spanish, you would say voy comer without the preposition, as some other varieties of moments have. Uh, and the boy a comer, that is something that appears in all texts uh, in, in, the, in the printed version at that time. Uh, so uh, that is another case in which it was almost every single case. And those uh, cases without a preposition they still survive in the beginning of the 16th century. Uh, so that would be another case. Besides the Although you cannot say that that is standardization or not, because it was appearing all over. The cases of the Olismo, the Olismo, this Seville uh, printed version, uh, it, it was the Ista. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. system that we have in this country, it necessitates the need, if this system is to survive, the need is there, it must expand. So you look at the areas that America is trying to expand in, it's people of color, it's no way around it. The other stuff people talk about is nothing but chewed up grass called bullshit. The problem I have is that too often we alienate ourselves because of ethnicities. Like black people will take up the black struggle or Hispanics will take up their struggle. But there's no way you can defeat it unless they come together as one and realize what's going on in this country to keep people of color oppressed. And yes, white people have to give up something. They didn't earn this country, they freaking stole it. So in reality, they have no right to it. Even though you hear people now talking about the illegal aliens from Mexico, they stole it twice. They weren't happy when they stole it the first time and set the borders at the Pecos River. They had to move farther into the Rio Grande. So people should wake up and realize that unless all people come together, they will always be on the short end of the stick because for this system to survive, it must be. I'm going to ask that uh, 
I'm going to ask that, you know, you already quoted a nine. We've got a line here, which is great. But I'm going to ask that, that people uh, get a little bit focused on what they want to ask or what they want to, the point they want to discuss and, and uh, minimize. I'm going to, I'm going to take the, the privilege of the chair for just a second and raise something that I've been thinking about the past several days. And that is the layerings, the layerings of racism in this recent case in Miami. Okay? Here are guys, African American guys that are identified as Muslim, identified as terrorists, uh, et cetera. It's all been stripped away clean already. Uh, but it, again, the, the, the layerings of racism in it are, are just phenomenal. I, I just wanted to throw that into the hopper. But uh, you, know, you might want to, I, I interrupt and comment to Will. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest. It is not a case I'm familiar enough with, you know, to feel able to comment on. I caught a little bit on Democracy Now! either this morning or, or yesterday morning, but it, it's something that, that I, I want to sit down and read about a little bit more. But the initial, the initial reports coming out definitely suggest that, that we're going to have a lot of interesting inter-ethnic and inter-religious analysis to offer up. It, it's definitely a story worth watching. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I have two comments. The first one, it seems to me that the papers and the American people or people every place w demand that the Arab population, the Muslim population, denounce the uh, terrorists or denounce the bomb throwers or, or, the, or the people who are attacking either uh, in Iraq and insurgents who may be just actually uh, defending their country or the pa pa Palestinians. So that's one of the comment. They seem to have to say, well, you have to say something about it. And I read an article in the paper that said, well, why should we? I mean, is it to say that we have to defend something or say something when uh, maybe it isn't true? The second question is, uh, you heard about Hamas and how they refuse to recognize Israel. And my question or my comment on that is, why should they recognize Israel? Israel has never recognized the Palestinian Authority, has never dealt with them honestly, so why should they recognize them? And then my question is, as you just said a few minutes ago, there is a difference of opinion among the Arab uh, peoples and the groups, but when the people in the United States and other places hear it, they're only hearing one side of it. The ones that they agree with, they're not hearing what the whole argument is and where it came from historically. So I was wondering about your comment on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I, I mean, your, your questions were um, more rhetorical than anything else and ones with which I happen to agree. So I, I thank you for coming and for offering them. I'm going to keep it brief because I know a lot of people want to talk. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a double standard. It's, it's, it's a complete, evident double standard, all right? And it has a flip side to it, by the way, all right? The, the double standard is clear. Everybody's always asking the Palestinians, the colonized population, all right? Recognize Israel, recognize Israel, which they've done more times than I can count, okay? It's, it, it, it has happened so many times, formally and informally, so they need to drop the bullshit about recognizing Israel. That has happened way more times that Israel has recognized Palestine. Zero, all right, zero. All right? There is no Palestinian state, all right? There is none. So there is, that's the double standard, right? And the Palestinians are always being forced, recognize Israel, recognize Israel. And who comes to the United States last week and says, we believe, right, that all of Israel belongs eternally and evermore to the Jews. Nobody's on this case, all right? So this is the double standard. But the flip side to it is that people are always lecturing the Palestinians. Right? about how they should comport themselves in resistance to this colonization. And the, the one thing that really gets my goat is that they're always being told, why don't you choose nonviolent resistance? Why don't you choose nonviolent resistance? To which I would respond, every time they've chosen a nonviolent avenue of resistance, the same people who are lecturing to them to keep nonviolent, right, blockaded. Take the issue of divestment. All right? That is a quintessentially fantastic nonviolent mode of resistance to colonization. And every time issue of divestment from companies that have holdings in Israel comes up, right? the same people who are exhorting Palestinians to be nonviolent come and blockade it. All right? so, so 
it's not only that the, the Palestinians are being, are, are being made, asked, forced really, to do things that, that their colonizers are not being asked to do, it's also that, that they're put in this sort of situation as resistors, right? right? Where the same double standard works on the flip side, right? You know, they, they can do no wrong. I mean, they can do no right as resistors, all right? So, so you know, there's sort of a flip side to that that I wanted to make you aware of. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks a lot, too, for, uh, for this conversation. I think this is a very important conversation for the entire war movement, especially, to be having. I think it's a major weakness that it doesn't come up enough. Um, I guess I first wanted to address this thing about who benefits from racism, because I think, quite frankly, I don't know wherever my went, but you know, that he, quite frankly, doesn't have enough power to kind of be benefiting from, from like, the war and, 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 and the perpetuation of, of racism. And I think actually the people who benefit from racism are the ones you're benefiting from the war at the same time, and that's like Bush and, quite frankly, Condoleezza Rice, you know, the woman who has a, an oil tanker named after her, you know. Um, so I think that it's more along class lines um, um, than, than anything else. Um, you know, that they can't perpetuate a, a war without dividing people to make, you know, make people scapegoats. Um, you know, that it started, you know, with back in the Vietnam War with the demonization of gooks. Then you had the My Lai massacre. And now you have Haditha. I mean, I think that these things are very much connected. And and it basically, you know, in a, you know, we're not the ones who are benefiting from, you know, um, from this war. That we're the ones that are dying in it. You know, um, so I guess in the you know the other side of what I wanted to say is that why is it so important for the anti-war movement to take up the issue? of anti-Arab racism, which I think they have, and I think it's a very major, major weakness in why, the, the, you know, part of why the movement has gone nowhere, um, because it's sort of, you know, cut out the people who are really being victimized the most by, by this war. Um, you know, there's a silence on, on the, uh, the issue of the pr prisoners at Guantanamo, um, and I guess, you know, leading to my question is, is you know, the, it's also and the inability of them to address and, and support the, the Iraqis on the ground who are fighting occupation because it's you know, not this perfect secular fight back that, oh, well, they're all Muslim terrorists, so we can't support them. So I guess I was wondering sort of, you know, I believe that you know, everyone has the absolute right to fight back, you know, even if those, you know, I'm not there. You know, if those methods aren't perfect, they're fighting back, and I think that's a good thing. So I support that. Um, you know, do I think that necessarily kidnapping is, you know, the best strategy? I would say maybe not, but but I absolutely support their right to fight back. And I guess I was wondering what, what you thought about the Iraqi resistance and, and, you know, whether we should be, you know, sitting, you know, sort of vocally more supportive of their right to fight back. Right. Um, uh, thanks for coming for the question, which is really provocative. Um, yes, I believe that, that anybody who, any people who's invaded or, or put upon in, in a similar way has the right to fight back. In fact, international law dictates that, that, that people have a right to, to colonization, invasion, and fight back. But, you know, I, I, any time there is a, a resistance to colonization or imperialism, in which category the American invasion of Iraq certainly falls, right? You know, that resistance is always going to... Uh, uh, raise a certain number of moral questions, but in the end, you know, I always say, I'm not from there, I'm not living there, it's not for me to tell them how they should be resisting, right? It's, it's for me, right, to try my damnedest to tell my government how I think it's comporting itself there, right? Uh, horridly, by the way, um, uh, not well at all, um, and, and I think it should come home, but, but in terms of the, the morality of what Iraqis on the ground are doing to, to resist, um, you know, Whatever judgment I might have about it, I would suppress on principle. Hi, thank you for being here. I'm glad you're here, and thanks for setting us up. Um, I just think about how we're all human beings on our planet, and you know, we all want to see our children happy and thrive and everything like that on a global level. Um, but yes, we're all human beings. And we're diverse, too, and we should value the diversity and learn from each other. And also, our planet is in big trouble, and it gives us a wonderful opportunity to come together and work together to help 
save our planet. Right. Right. So. Yeah. No, I agree. Thank you. That's true. I mean, that, that's the one issue that you think humans, uh, uh, transethnically, would be able to agree on, right? <laughs> and, and that, that might be it. But, but again, there, right, there are so many corporate and economic interests in, in the destruction of the environment, right? That it's the same up. Yeah. Yeah. That I agree. Diana. Apart from the various meaning based uh, explanations, have you seen or would you expect any changes that would just simply be formal? Like all things being equal, there's a move towards a small, a shorter word, or away from a shorter word to a longer word. Have you looked at that now? As far as formal, not necessarily. Um, I think I've read some studies on morphology that some of the roots might prefer the particular ending because that would be new changes. So in the case of, for instance, this one that I studied, it was faulty in many ways. Um, and in December there was another edition, December of, 19, of 1481, that introduced uh, more changes. And in 1555, the most famous one, uh, uh, that of course they now escapes my mind, obviously, um, but that one uh, that I remember, uh, that one was uh, that's the, the most famous one because that's supposed to be the cleanest as far as mistakes were complete with gloss. It is ended up being a shorter uh, word, uh, but that didn't necessarily seem to be uh, as much uh, evidence to support it. In this case, as far as form, I I think it is, or at least examples that I have. And uh, studied, and others that I have studied, they, the, the form doesn't necessarily, except for whether it comes from more Latinate or not. Uh, then the Latinate tends to, to become, uh, to stay about. And all sorts of different things. So each edition will bring another one. The Academy has another one in 1807. And that goes with different methodologies as far as bringing the text that it was original from back in the 13th century. So they had a whole bunch of manuscripts to work with. So they bring different different changes each time. For me it's interesting the incunables, which is the, the first printing, are the incunables. Those are very important because that's the that's the first version. And after that the changes on the actual printing business. Uh, so when you, uh, the printing might have rights for, I don't know, maybe let's say 1,000 copies. And then after that you have to renew that contract, so to speak, so it was the same uh, way. And then maybe you, maybe the new edition would introduce